Titindig tayo para sa demokrasya. Maraming salamat ho. At ang demokrasya, mari na po tayong umupo, hindi lamang nanganganib dito sa Pilipinas at sa iba't ibang bansa dito sa ating rehiyon. Ito po ay nanganganib din sa iba't ibang bahagi ng mundo. At ngayong, uh, ngayong hapon, pakikinggan natin ang dalawang karanasan na magsasabi na ang paggamit ng batas laban sa mamamayan ay laganap din sa iba't ibang lugar. This afternoon, we will listen to the stories of the struggle and the resistance of other peoples in the world that the use of law, the weaponizing of law against critics, against people who defend human rights is not just here in the Philippines, not just in the region, but all over the world. And this is going to be shared with us by Jainathi Devi Balaguro. She is the National President of the Council of Action for Liberal and Democracies. She will tell us the stories of their members in different democracies under threat. She is from Malaysia, a lawyer and an active member of the Pertre Garakan Rakyat of Malaysia. Okay. Next is uh, someone who comes from the other side of the globe to tell us also the story in France, in Europe. She will be telling us about the story of the struggle of their party. The party, in, translated in English, means France unbowed or France undefeated. Please welcome Marina Menur. Thank you, Marina. So both of them traveled across uh, NCOV, and they're here with us to share their stories. And from the Philippines, to help us reflect together with what they have to say, we have three panel of uh, reactors. One is someone whom you know very well because he was a, parliament, a, a member of Congress and was very much instrumental in defending indigenous people's rights. Please welcome from the Cordillera, former Congressman Teddy Baguila. And of course, we cannot have this conversation as we heard this morning over and over again that the future and the present lies in the hands of the younger generation. We, of course, are going to be always around standing with you. But the future and today is in the hands of the youth. So two people representing young people will be with us. One is the former head of the Akbayan Youth Group. Uh, let's welcome Rafaela David. Many of you know her as Paeng, uh, who has been with us in many protest actions as one of the main, uh, main, uh, what shall we say, moderator. <laughs> and of course, we must have someone who is studying the law and will eventually be the one to be part of the group of lawyers who will combat the use of law against people. Please welcome Shanti Lasala. So we have a very uh, exciting panel, I think. As I said, this is a panel that will show to us here in the Philippines that this phenomena of weaponizing the law does not, is not limited here in the Philippines or in the region. So to share with us the story first is, uh, may I welcome the president of CAL, Jaya Nathi, uh, to give us her story. Good afternoon. Please allow me to begin my presentation 
by expressing my sincere gratitude to the organizers of this international forum for the kind invitation, Maraming Salamat, and Mabuhai. It gives me great pleasure to be with all of you today to discuss this worrying enemy in Asia and the rest of the world. I come here as representative of the Council of Asian Liberal and Democrats, CALD, Women's Caucus, and International Network of Liberal Women, INLW. For those of you who may not be aware, CALD is a regional network of liberal and democratic political parties in Asia, while the INLW is an association of women from countries worldwide who support liberal principles. What binds these two organizations I represent is their commitment to liberal principles and values. I am aware that the term liberal has negative connotations in many parts of Asia and in the Philippines. I was informed that the label has been demonized since your presidential elections of 2016. However, the very essence of liberalism actually harks at principles and values that we all hold dear as members of the civilized society. Individual freedom, human rights, tolerance, equality of opportunity, social justice, and the rule of law. Rule of law is defined by the United Nations as a principle of governance in which all persons, institutions, and entities, public and private, including the state itself, are accountable to laws that are publicly promulgated, equally enforced, and independently adjudicated, and which are consistent with international human rights norms and standards. The UN elaborates that rule of law requires measures to ensure adherence to the principles of supremacy of the law, equality before the law, accountability to the law, fairness in the application of the law, separation of powers, participation in decision-making, legal certainty, avoidance of arbitrary, uh, arbitrariness and procedural and legal transparency. As a liberal and a practicing lawyer myself, I have always believed that there should be rule of law over rule of men and rule by law. The great British liberal philosopher John Locke once said, whenever law ends, tyranny begins. I could not agree more. For my presentation today, let me tell you about three recent cases from the International Liberal Network where the rule of law has been compromised, and this phenomena of lawfare has become the norm. Of course, we have already heard the unfortunate cases of lawfare in the Philippines and Cambodia in the previous sessions, and how it targets prominent political personalities like Senator Leila, Leila de Lima and Sam Ramsey, among other opposition politicians and activists. In Asia, however, comparable cases can also be seen in countries like Singapore and China. Outside the region, particularly in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia came under the spotlight in recent years because of its treatment of dissidents and human rights activists. By presenting these three cases, my wish is to lend credence to this argument, lawfare is not new. Semi-authoritarian and authoritarian regimes have routinely weaponized the law to silence dissent and maintain their hold to political power. However, in an era marked by democratic decline, rise of populist leaders, and preponderance of disinformation, we can surmise the repressive regimes may be more emboldened to weaponize the law against opponents. Worse, given this prevailing Sage is there's a possibility that even supposedly mature and emerging democracies could be increasingly drawn to the phenomena of lawfare. To prove this point, please allow me to present the recent experiences of Singapore, China, and Saudi Arabia on lawfare. Singapore, bankruptcy and captivity in the land of the wealthy. Many of us in Asia look at Singapore as a model for economic development. 
because of its remarkable economic transformation within a short period of time from third world to first, as what the autobiography of Lee Kuan Yew, founding father of former Singaporean Prime Minister, described it. However, it has to be said that this economic development came at a huge cost in terms of repressing political and civil rights. I know this for a fact because an opposition party in Singapore, which belongs to the cult network, the Singapore Democratic Party, SDP, has been routinely subjected into repressive laws. For one, SDP's current Secretary General, Dr. Chi Sun Chuan, has been bankrupted, arrested, imprisoned, and barred from leaving the country numerous times in the past two decades. In 2001, senior leaders Lee Kuan Yew and Go Chok Tong filed defamation charges against Dr. Chi for remarks he allegedly made regarding a loan to Indonesian President Suharto. In February 2006, after Dr. Chi failed to pay Singapore 500,000 in court awarded damages, he was declared bankrupt, which prohibited him from running in the 2006 elections and from leaving the country. For this reason, Dr. Chi, who also served as a cult chairperson in 2008 to 2010, was actually not able to attend any of our network meetings outside of Singapore. He was only released from bankruptcy in 2012 when Lee Kuan Yew and Go Chok Tong accepted his offer of Singapore 30,000 as settlement. Apart from this defamation case, Dr. Chi was also convicted four times for speaking in a public area with audience, numbering to 40 to 50 people, to four to five times about the month of May 2006 elections. In each instance, Dr. Chi encouraged people to purchase copies of the New Democrat, the party's newspaper, as a way of support to his party. The courts convicted Dr. Chi of violating the Public Entertainments and Meetings Act, which provides that any person who provides any public entertainment without a license under this act shall be guilty of an offense and shall be liable to, on conviction to a fine not, exceed, not exceeding Singapore 10,000. Furthermore, the 2009 Public Order Act allows the police to stop protests even if it is by one individual. Hence, other members of the SDP also have been fined and jailed, many repeatedly for speaking without a permit or for public assembly. And the definition of what is treated as an assembly is extremely broad, and those who fail to obtain the required permits face criminal charges. For example, SDP supporters and activist Jolovan Wam was prosecuted in 2018 for three counts of violating the Public Order Act for organizing two peaceful protests and a candlelight vigil. In the same year, SDP member and performance artist Silen Pillay was convicted of violating the same act by walking from Hong Lim Park to Parliament carrying a piece of art to commemorate the 32-year detention of Chia Tai Po, who was imprisoned under the Internal Security Act. In May 2018, the government charged Jolovan Wam again. This time, it was for scandalizing the judiciary by posting on Facebook that Malaysia's judges are more independent than Singapore's for cases with political implications. Authorities also charged SDP Vice Chairman John Tan with contempt for commenting on his Facebook page that Wam's prosecution only confirms that what Wam said is true. On October 9th, both were found guilty of contempt of court and were asked to pay Singapore 5,000 each. With the passage of the Protection from Online Falsehoods and Manipulation Act in May 2019, Singapore has procured another weapon in its law for, lawfare arsenal. Worried that this law should further silence oppositionists and activists, SDP recently challenged it in the High Court. Looking at the Singapore experience, it may be good to be reminded of Dr. Chi's words. He said, and I quote, I admit that democracy is not a subject that lends itself to urgent attention in society preoccupied with material riches. But I can no longer wait to warn the people of the dangers that lie ahead. If society affords not to pay attention, 
Unfortunately, by the time the situation turns so dire, we may rue the lost opportunity to defend our politi political rights and ourselves. China, using the law against defenders of the law. China is another country which, like Singapore, takes pride in its economic achievements. However, like Singapore, sorry, however, like Singapore, this Chinese model of development also comes at the expense of fundamental freedoms and the rule of law. The rule of law, or lack of it in China, was at the center of the now scraped extradition bill in Hong Kong, which led to months long protests in the city which continue to this day. As you probably know, the bill that would have allowed suspected criminals in Hong Kong to be sent to mainland for trial. It has been widely criticized because of the difficulty of ensuring basic judicial protections in the mainland, which allegedly practices arbitrary detention, forced confessions, one-sided trials, and even torture. With a 99.9% .9 conviction rate of defendants in China, the Hong Kong people who have always treasured the British legacy in its legal system have enough reason to be concerned. In China, officials can easily dictate the entire proceedings. There could be obvious errors and negligence in the case before the verdict was delivered. Hence, there have been cases in the past when people were found innocent years after they were executed. In recent years, lawfare was used primarily to silence human rights lawyers and activists throughout disbarment and imprisonment. Chinese authorities started weaponizing disbarment of human rights lawyers about a decade ago. The technique has te intensified since August 2017, two years after the 709 crackdown in which police rounded up more than 300 human rights lawyers and activists across the country. For this crackdown, nine were convicted of subverting state power, inciting subversion of state power, or picking quarrels and provoking trouble. Three people were given suspended sentences and one exempted from criminal punishment while remaining under surveillance. A number of these lawyers or activists still remain in prison. This strong arm techniques of China, unfortunately, can also be observed in other parts of the world. Saudi Arabia, apostasy and the death of democracy. For one in Saudi Arabia, dissidents, human rights activists, and independent clerics also bear the brunt of lawfare, according to the Human Rights Watch. Last year, the country faced unprecedented international criticism for its human rights record, including the failure to provide full accountability for the murder of Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi by Saudi agents in October 2018. Saudi Arabia also opened individual trials of prominent Saudi women before the Riyadh Criminal Court last year and dismissed all allegations that the women faced torture or ill treatment in detention. Most of the women faced charges that were solely related to peaceful human rights work, including promoting women rights and calling for an end to Saudi Arabia's discriminatory male guardianship system. Prosecutors also accused the women of sharing information about women's rights in Saudi Arabia with journalists based in Saudi Arabia, diplomats and international human rights organizations, including Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International deeming such contracts a criminal offense. In the International Liberal Network, the most well-known case is that of Raif Badawi, a Saudi Arabian writer and activist and the creator of the website Free Saudi Liberals. The website championed free speech. It was a space where Saudis can openly speak about liberalism in a highly conservative country. Mr. Badawi said that talking about liberalism openly is considered an apostasy, which is a crime punishable by death. That is why very few Saudis talk about it. He challenged the established rule in Saudi Arabia. He questioned the need of male guardians for women. He asked why all Saudis need to believe in Islam, and he stated that it can't explain everything, and people should be free to believe in whatever they want. For this reason, he was arrested on 2012 on charges of insulting Islam, though electronic channels and several charges, including apostasy. He was sentenced to seven years in prison, and 600 lashes in 2013, but that was changed and increased to 10 years in prison and 1,000 lashes in 2014 plus a fine. He remains in prison to this day. 
These cases of Singapore, China, and Saudi Arabia show that semi-authoritarian and authoritarian regimes appear to be more emboldened to deploy law for lawfare against political dissenters, human rights activists, and democracy advocates. What is more alarming is even relatively advanced democracies, such as the Philippines, as seen most prominently in the case of Senator Lilayla de Naima, are also drawn to the use of lawfare. At a time when we are seeing a global decline of democracy and corresponding, corresponding rise of authoritarianism, illiberalism, and populism, lawfare has become the new normal. For this reason, we as democracy and human rights advocates should be united in our resistance to this worrying state of affairs. Let me end by quoting Senator De Lima, to defend the rule of law is to defend what makes us human beings living in a civilized world. To defend it is to defend our freedom to seek truth, to seek justice, and to seek our own destiny. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Jayanathi. And now let's welcome Marina into the podium. So good afternoon, everyone. First of all, sorry for my English. I'm, I'm not fluent, but I will try to do my best for you to understand well what I'm saying. Um, I would like to start this speech by telling you how honor and happy I, I am to be here uh, to participate to, to this International Forum on Lofer. I have to say it has been a difficult time to arrive until this day because, as you know, the first time we tried to book a flight it was a volcano eruption. After that, I tried to buy, book another flight and they say you cannot because you pass by China. So finally, uh, I'm here because I think uh, we are all together to um, uh, stand up against the lawfare practices and uh, it's a good, good signal to see all of you here to, to be with us. So thanks, uh, thanks so much for the organizer, which make a fantastic work uh, and the university for sure to hosting us. A few months ago, uh, the, our political party tried to, an international, to launch an international campaign on lawfare. Because we face lawfare practices also in France, and we were thinking we are not the only one, and we want to be all together to fight against these practices. So we launched a petition, an international petition, and a few weeks after the, the beginning of the petition, we received a support from 35 countries. 35 countries to denounce the lawfare practices in their country. And this, during this campaign, by we, we first uh, heard about the case of uh, the senatrice Leila de Lima. And that's why we have signed and support all the campaign which have been made to, uh, to make her uh, free. So we have signed all the member of, her, of the member of her, her um, uh, in the par French Parliament have signed uh, the call for the release. And now we have at this first uh, international forum on the fair, it's the first in the world, and we hope that in the coming months it will have new forum on the fair in also in Europe, in Africa, in America, because we need to push for this issue all over Europe, uh, all over Europe, the world, sorry. Because this key subject of lawfare practices it's a real danger for our democracy. Whatever our country are, whatever our political opinion are, and which can be different, but we'll all put together democracy above everything. And it's time, it's time then to be together, to join our forces, to stop all tactics and, pro and strategy which attack our democratic value. It's very interesting to see that in the 1617, Eva start with a, a military dictatorship with, which was imposing the privation of freedom and liberty. But now the method can appear more softer, so, soft, sorry, more soft, uh, much, much more insidious, much, much more sophisticated. And it is exactly what it is a lawfare. It's an instrument for use to, of the use of the justice against political, for the political end, to paralyze, eliminate, 
political adversary, which can be politician, but not only, it can be also trade unionist, it can be also activist. And why this lawfare practices are, are particularly serious is because the most beautiful things of humanity, the most beautiful value are initially thrown into justice. So what happened in France, I will uh, try to give you uh, some update in a few words, but first of all, it's for us, the lawfare is four main characteristics. The first is to always start with a denunciation and accusation without evidence. It is the case for the Senat Senator Leila de Lima, but it is also the case that it's appeared in, in Ecuador, for example, when uh, the, the ex-president, Rafael Coeira, one day a political opposant wake up and say, um, the services of the ex-president have been kidnapped me without proof, no report, no witness, but this denunciation without evidence was the first point to put uh, the, um, Rafael Correa in trial and, and continue in the juridical process. So it's, it always starts in the idea to not seek the truth, but to put a doubt on a person. It's the first main point. The second point is, is not when you have lawfare practices, it's, just, it's not just any judge or prosecutor who intervene. We are dealing with a politicized justice. And on this case, I can uh, explain to you the, the case of uh, the judge Moro in Brazil, which is the one which put in prison Lula, and her political party will have met Lula in prison few in, in the, during the summer. And the same judge which put Lula in prison becomes the minister of justice few months after well, under Bolsonaro government. So it's not it's, an except, it's a, a judge and prosecutor linked to the political power. The third point is the lawfare is al alway, always mar marked by a multiplication of procedure around the main case. Because the idea is to put the um, pressure, uh, the process of keeping people under pressure from the justice system, but, but also under juridical and, and fiscal pressure. So it means we want to put people, and we saw that with the multiplication of the cases also, in the case of uh, Leila de Lima. The final point is also the role of the media. In all the cases of lawfare, we have saw the important, the central role of media. And the media in vi on these cases are not neutral, are not trying to say the truth. They are soft often create a distortion, filter of the reality and participate of charging the, the accused. And we have saw, for our point of view, also in France, that, for example, during election, election campaign, the cases we've come back by the media during the election campaign. So it's also um, a problem of, uh, during a democratic process, the role of the media. What happened, so now, now that I give you the four main characteristics, what happened in France? Everything starts with a denunciation from the extreme, the far right uh, political party, uh, saying that there is uh, some fake job inside the European Parliament, which was deal with her political party. Uh, and uh, the media also accused, even if everything was validated by the auditor, that the account during the electoral campaign, the French presidential electoral campaign, was not there is some thing of overcharging. All these accusations have been never follow of fact. All these accusations have been never uh, make open an investigation until we arrive in October 2018 and the government even is in the government of Macron is in very big trouble because there is huge mobilization in France against the, labor, the liberal reform and there is a scandal where we see the special advisor of the president, which is beating the young uh, high school student in the street during the demonstration. And it's become a, a scandal of the state. Until this scandal arrived to the need for the government to um, change, to reshuffle the government, because a lot of the ministry have to resign. 
and the day, the day of the changing of the government because of all this trouble, we at, se at seven in the morning he start an unprecedented searches on her party. So it means we have more than 200 poli police officers which arrive in uh, the headquarters, the office of her political party, in all the house of the member, the leader of the party, to make investigation on things that we don't know exactly what it is. And it takes all the day. And during all the day, you have seen the TV, the investigation again, her party during the day where the government is trying to put a new government in place. 19 year, uh, 19, sorry, 19 months after that, there is no any evidence, there is no trial against us about this uh, allegation for the extreme right or for, yeah, I take them um, So nothing appear, but we continue to fight uh, until they try to use these cases to put now a leader in difficulty. And uh, they have put a new trial for him because during the searches he say he's not uh, agree with what happened. It's, he say it's, uh, it's not right, it's not justice what you are doing. And for this he's now um, going to a trial for rebellion because he say he's, he's not, he, there is nothing, no violence, nothing, but just the fact to say that he's, not, he's opposed to this was, uh, uh, was enough to put him in the trial. So what I want to say, because I saw it's the time and I want to respect it, um, it's that it's true that the case in France may not have reached the same level that we can see today in the Philippines, in Brazil, or in Cambodia. But it, this is not less particularly worrying about the state of our democracy. So today, I stand here in the Philippines in the name of the main left political party in France, France Insoumise, to defend with you our common value as a human right defender, to give a total support and solidarity to all Filipino which is defending the human right and the liberty of the Leila de Lima. When you start, you say that the name of our party is France Insoumise, which is not, there is not a real translation in English, but it means that we are not submitted to a system. We are not, we are unsubmit, unsubmissive. And today I want to be with you all unsubmissive to the injustice that you are facing here. We want the justice. It's time for justice. It's time for the immediate release of Senator Leila de Lima. Thank you so much, Marina. And uh, now we are going to have a message from a person who also comes from the United Nations. His name is uh, Dr. David Gay. My name is David Kay. I'm the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Opinion and Expression. Thank you very much for the opportunity to address you at this important conference, uh, which marks the anniversary of the unjust detention of Senator de Lima, uh, but also highlights the ways in which states and other actors around the world have been putting pressure on legitimate expression, on dissent, on public debate, for many years. In these few minutes, what I would like to do is say a few words about the ways in which governments do impose that kind of pressure and the ways in which political leaders impose that pressure and use the tools uh, that are at their disposal, tools of law, tools of law enforcement, uh, and also the tools of the platform of governance in order to implicate and to pressure uh, legitimate dissent and other forms of debate. So let me say a few words uh, to begin with about the nature of my mandate. The mandate of the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Opinion and Expression rests in particular 
on Article 19 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the ICCPR. Article 19 guarantees everyone's right to maintain an opinion without interference. That is a strict right that's subject and can be subject, subjected to absolutely no uh, restriction or limitation. The Article 19 also protects and guarantees everyone's right to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas of all kinds, regardless of frontiers, and through any media. That is a robust right. To seek, receive, and impart, this is language that was developed in the 1940s as part of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and yet it almost assumes the development of a platform like the internet for speech. Seek, receive, impart, and regardless of frontiers. Now, of course, states may impose restrictions on the freedom of expression, but those restrictions under Article 19, Paragraph 3, must be extremely limited. And there's a three-part test that we use in order to evaluate state restrictions. That three-part test requires that a state demonstrate, not that the victim of any kind of restriction demonstrate, but that the state demonstrate that three conditions are met. One, that the restriction is provided by law, that is, it exists in law and it's narrow and clear and precise enough to provide guidance and limit the discretion of the state. It's necessary and proportionate to achieve its aims, and the aims must be legitimate aims. Those aims must be, for instance, one of the protection of the rights or reputations of others, public order or national security, or public health and morals. Those are the only grounds on which restriction, uh, expression may be restricted. So Article 19, which is binding on a country like the Philippines, is absolutely a robust statement of the freedom of expression and an absolutely uh, robust statement of how governments can be limited in their uh, implementation of restrictions. But over the last several years, particularly with the rise of the internet, we've seen states resort to a number of tactics in order to limit speech. Now, some of those restrictions are restrictions that are, are very much the same as they've been historically. The kind of pressure that we have seen imposed on journalists, on politicians, on opposition figures, on those simply in regular dissent um, that we've seen for generations. So, for example, the criminalization of dissent, the criminalization and censorship of adverse views, of criticism of government. Those kinds of tactics have long been used by governments in order to restrict public space, in order to restrict public debate. But they've also gone in different directions in recent years. So, for example, uh, it's been a part of law for for centuries, really, that a person could bring a claim of defamation uh, where speech actually produces a real harm to one's reputation. And there's variation on the defamation claims and the law on defamation uh, around the world. Uh, but there has been a, a, a claim, a cause of action for defamation uh, for, for many, many generations. Um, for several years, there's been an effort to limit criminal defamation because criminal defamation is almost always a disproportionate attack on the freedom of expression. And there's been a global campaign to urge states to end, to remove criminal defamation from their statute books. Unfortunately, even as governments have removed criminal defamation, and that is defamation that the state prosecutes, uh, which is invariably used to limit debate and, and public speech. Uh, we've also seen a rise in civil defamation claims. And this is where individual politicians, government ministers, and others bring claims against individual journalists or those in dissent or others, um, and 
they sue them in court. We, we think of these as slap suits, uh, strategic lit litigation against public participation. These are suits that are designed to limit speech and debate. And this is a form of, to use the term from the conference, lawfare, that is extremely concerning, not only because it allows government ministers and others to bring suit in order to limit speech and debate, but also because the penalties often seek to bankrupt those who are speaking or writing or debating or raising criticism of government. These are just a few ways in which governments are seeking to implicate, to pressurize uh, speech ar around the world. We see this in the Philippines and we see this in many other places. We also see, as many of you know, the use of the internet as a space to, in a sense, flood the zone with disinformation, to flood the zone, to flood the internet with uh, pressure on speakers, with disinformation, with attacks, particularly misogynistic attacks, which we've seen uh, on the rise in all places, including in the Philippines. And I'm particularly concerned about that use of public space and of the private space of the internet in order to uh, impose pressures on legitimate speech, on journalism. And at the end of the day, we have to remember this is, this is not only about protecting specific journalists or specific media outlets or specific public figures. It's about protecting our rights as individuals, as citizens, to engage in public debate and to seek and receive information that shed light, sheds light on what government is doing in our names, with our tax dollars, uh, and, uh, and what it is doing in order to limit the freedom uh, of our franchise, our ability to vote, to participate in public life. So I think we have the tools in international human rights law and in domestic law to fight back against these kinds of restrictions. And in closing, what I want to suggest is that I stand with you in the work that you're doing, that I stand with you in your efforts to fight against unjust restrictions on freedom of expression. And I look forward to working with you. And I know that my colleagues in the UN special procedure system look forward and stand ready to work with you as you fight for freedom of opinion and expression, for public participation, and a, for a free and open society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So much can still be said. And that's why I will appeal to our panel of reactors. There are still a lot of other uh, groups that are going to be going into their uh, subgroups. So may I call on former Congressman Teddy Bagilan to give his response. Good afternoon. Um, mula ng umaga until ngayon sa mga kwento about what's happening all over the world, um, my take is that we have a, the development of a very lethal and insidious leader prototype, and that is or that of a wily and crafty authoritarian pretending to be a liberal democrat. From, from Duterte to Putin to Trump to Bolsonaro to Erdogan. Kasi noon, when you say dictator, so blatant. Marcos, Suharto, Sukarno. Now you have dictators who are using the same instruments of democracy to entrench themselves in power. But I wouldn't be talking too much about lawfare and uh, would like to thank our presenters already for showing you the global trend. I'll focus as a reaction as to how Congress, the parliament, is being used in lawfare. Kasi nga kaninang umaga, pinag-usapan Kaya lumalakas ang lawfare in the Philippines because they use the parliament, they use the laws, they use the courts, the Supreme Court. In the parliament, especially in the three years, the, the, my last term as a congressman, dinamit rin talaga ang kongreso. No? Starting with the formation of the super coalition. So Congress became practically a rubber stamp of uh, the president. No? So that led to the impeachment of Chief Justice Corona. 
Now, in fact, uh, in, in Congress, you have other impeachment cases filed against um, Vice President Lenny Robredo, although this, not pro this did not progress because of uh, her clique within the Congress, because when she was a Congress um, woman, she was very popular. No? Laila de Lima's persecution also started in the House of Representatives. The Senate, of course, would not do the investigation, but Congress, Committee on Justice, beat that uh, bait and, and started the investigations of Laila. No? Uh, and the budget, weaponizing of the budget, no? Uh, is, is a dimension of lawfare. Because by law, Congress is supposed to pass the budget, allocate it to the districts. No? So, ang nangyari is, if you remember, Chito Gascon was speaking earlier, no? but if you remember, one time, no, they threatened the Commission on Human Rights with a one peso budget. No? That's how, so, that's how Congress' uh, budgetary powers is also being manipulated. And me personally, a victim of the weaponization of the budget because for us, few brave members of the genuine opposition tinanggalan yung budget namin sa amin distrito. And for a congressman representing a district, that is very sacred. That's our lifeline. No? If you're able to bring home the bacon. Because, you know, in Ifugao, realistically, nobody asks about what are the laws or the legislation that you're pushing? They always expect you to bring home the scholarships and everything else. No? So that's how Congress was used no? as part of the um, of, of lawfare. Even cha-cha. Kumakagat lang ang Congresa dyan. And then recently, uh, we, Congress or the House of Representatives recently passed an amendment to the Public Utilities Act which is actually essentially changing the Constitution. And my good friend, Teddy Gasinho, was also talking about the Anti-Terrorist Act. No? In fact, that is a global trend. No? Yung pinag-usapan kanina, the global trend now is to pass anti-terrorism laws and anti-fake news laws to stifle dissent. No? Um, we, we miss the golden age of liberalism, which led to the Magna Carta for women, to all of these human rights laws. Now it's different, no? Because of the trends of uh, fake news and terrorism, no? In order to address these genuine issues naman siya, but now it's being used to stifle defend, dissent. Now, why did this happen? And this probably is going to be my last point, no? Why is this happening in Congress? Because we have a weak political party system. Our political parties are actually built around personalities. Unlike in more mature democracies, people identify with the political party, not with the personality. In fact, in the last elections, nanalo ang liberal. Bakit? Because most of the representatives, the governors, and congressmen were, were liberal party uh, affiliates. Pero since yung Pangulo, that's our political culture, is centered on personalities. So everybody transferred to PDP. Now they're losing all their membership. So ganun rin. That's how you stifle defense. Because regionally also, in, the, in, in Southeast Asia, I think culturally, ano tayo? we look for messianic, iconic, charismatic leaders. So the way to stifle dissent, which is what's happening in Cambodia, is to arrest their icons. So, Sana, I think, uh, as a response, you know, we've heard a lot about what we can do, but at least for us who work through the political parties, because I'm a member of the Liberal Party, um, the, 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 what we can do is really to go down and strengthen our mass base. So, ngayon, we learned a lesson. We're going down to the municipalities and provinces and organize, organizing chapters of true blue or true yellow liberal democrats so whether you're from the right or the left or at the center what's important is you believe in a certain ideology which is in our case freedom and human rights and you elect leaders na maninindigan doon sa patakaran na yon right? so uh, nakita ko dito na andito yata lahat ng puwersa ng dissent from the left to the right <laughs> one very interesting breakout session is you have Magdalo, Akbayan, and Bayan Muna, moderated by the liberals. <laughs> <laughs>
So maybe this is something revolutionary. So I I like to end by by again uh, asking you at least when we want to to combat low fare, let's look at our parliaments. Okay. They are now hearing an anti-fake news law in parliament, which will classify everything that is false as criminals, or might classify, and ang nangyayari kasi these are loose generalities. Eh. No? So maganda siguro, let's participate at least no, in, in the hearings of the parliament. No? So maraming maraming salamat po. Thank you, Congressman Teddy Bagilat. Mr. Lasala, can we have your thoughts here, please? Uh, he is the president of the Student Council of Arellano Law uh, University. Um, the Association of Law Students of the Philippines greets everyone a pleasant and lively afternoon. Um, we are one with all the courageous and peace-loving citizens and law advocates in this auditorium. We are in such a time that the law is being weaponized to stifle free speech and democratic dissent. This has always been the case when people remain silent and do nothing. That's the reason why we would like to thank the organizers of this Lawfare Forum for holding this event to somehow sound the alarm and continuously advance the rule of law in all spheres of the society. The ALSP truly believes in the power of law in promoting the ideals of democracy and advancing the interests of the citizens of this country. When the law is abused and weaponized for the interests of a few, then it becomes detrimental and destructive for the people it governs, free men becoming slaves again. This should not be the case for our beloved country and the nations out there. As our country progresses, so its democratic institution and its people progress as well. The result of us fighting for democracy and promoting justice results to us, results to all of us experiencing social justice. Yesterday, we celebrated the World Day of Social Justice. So let me just quote to you the case of Kalalang versus Phillips. I believe if you are a law student here, you are familiar with this, penned by Justice Laurel. In that case, Justice Laurel quoted and said that social justice, therefore, must be founded on the recognition of the necessity of interdependence among, the di among diverse units of society and of the protection that should be equally and evenly extended to all groups as a combined force in our social and economic life, consistent with the fundamental and paramount objective of the state of promoting the health, comfort, and quiet of all persons and of bringing about the greatest good to the greatest number. As we advance the rule of law, the expressions of democracy and social justice will be achieved. To advance the rule of law, the basics and practicality of law should be thought in the campuses, if possibly even in primary school. To advance the rule of law, let's continuously fight false news and misinformation and allow dissent, but also present truthful facts and information. To advance the rule of law, we should not remain silent, but be the voice of those who experience oppression and injustice. To advance the rule of law, we should continue, continuously hold forums and conferences like this that promotes the ideals of justice and democracy. To advance the rule of law, the youth and the young at heart in this room should always unite and collaborate to achieve true democracy, to advance the rule of law as faith-loving citizens of this country. Let's always put God in everything and be guided by Him in all our dealings. So, mabuhay tayong lahat and let's always fight for democracy and justice. Thank you. Maraming salamat. And now, can we hear also from another youth leader, uh, Rafaela David or Paeng as we know her Uh, magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat. Unahin ko na po, I will start with a word of congratulations to the organizers uh, for putting this together. What we're doing today is not just an international forum. I believe that it is a statement 
from all of us here that we will not stand down. Together, we will resist. So thank you and congratulations to everyone here. Um, I think I was invited today, this afternoon, to provide a youth perspective, perhaps, to lawfare and its various manifestations around the world. Um, I hope you will indulge me by showing to you some pictures that I hope can share or show at least um, my experience as a youth leader within a political party called Akbayan. Um, we in Akbayan has been pushing for uh, and working within the confines of law trying to engage it and um, challenge its boundaries to promote and pass progressive laws that are pro-people and pro-poor. So it is very disheartening and worrisome that the law now is being used not for the people but against the people. We in Akbayan were not, uh, were not stranger to having the law pushed uh, to silence some of the things that we are we want and we know has to be said. Our chairperson, who I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see, is also here with us this, uh, this afternoon. Uh, so maybe say, of course, a hi to Senator Risa Ontiveros, who's here with us. Just a shout out. Um, some of you probably know that uh, our chairperson is facing as well several cases from absurd wiretapping uh, allegations to kidnapping, uh, which of course, is uh, far, yeah, far from the reality. In fact, she was protecting the witnesses to the Kian killings. Um, so, but because of this lawfare that we are seeing, that's being more intense in the past few years, we know that we cannot do it alone. We know that we need the international community, just like what Joshua Wong said earlier in his video. That's why uh, in 2017, uh, we were happy to host, uh, at the end of 2017, an international mission from the Progressive Alliance and the Party of Europe European Socialists um, who stand in solidarity for those who are victimized by the law through the killings and also through the various cases that seek to silence opposition and dissent. But international solidarity also sometimes has a price. In fact, when we invited one of the delegates again to come back a year after, we were uh, surprised to find out uh, that he was already blacklisted from coming to the Philippines. When we invited him and we received the call that he was detained at the airport at Cebu, we realized that um, and in the beginning, it, was, it, it seemed funny that something like this would happen. Um, it's not in a lifetime we would uh, think that uh, our international uh, partners will also feel the brunt of uh, the government flexing its muscles against those who seek to stand for human rights. But nurturing international solidarity does not happen overnight. It happens years, decades. That's why we believe that it is through international solidarity among young people that we can build a better world. That's why in uh, Akbayan, we also seek to, we seek to foster uh, international solidarity through trainings, uh, making sure that young people are also part of dreaming for a better, more humane society. You have here a picture of um, activists from all over Asia also standing, uh, standing for Laila de Lima. I show you one picture. This is not the most flattering picture. Of course, when you have international events where young people are, sometimes it ends up with drinking, sometimes, uh, sometimes with singing, sometimes with drinking. I point you to the guy here playing a guitar. He was one of the participants of, of, in one of our trainings in, uh, hosted here in the Philippines. Um, and he was popular with the group because he was the one always uh, uh, playing the guitar, singing John Lennon songs, um, hoping for a more peaceful, singing for a more peaceful world. Um, it was not just, it was not soon, it was not uh, that, uh, it was, not, it was just a few months after that we would find out that he would lead protests in Thailand, risking his own freedom. So along with other activists who were rallying against the military-backed uh, new charter in 2016, um, he, would be one, he would be detained just for giving away leaflets. 
arguing that the people not vote for the new constitution. But I realized this was not new. This did not just happen with one of our comrades from Thailand. Two years earlier from then, in 2014, we held a similar event uh, where we trained another set of young leaders, again, to build international solidarity. I show you here a picture of some of our friends, very young idealists from Myanmar, um, with our fellow Filipinos. Uh, you have their, yeah, um, three Myanmar, and then uh, four from Myanmar, and one Filipina. Um, just a few months later, so we did this in January 2014. By March, we found out that these two young kids were also fighting for their own rights with a new education law being passed by Myanmar um, that will strengthen government support within the campus. And some of our leaders, the two who was in the picture, would be arrested. Uh, they were representatives from the All Burma Federation of Student Unions. So what we see here are young people also being, also being victimized by the hands of the law. Okay, because they're saying I should wrap up. So just maybe two more people I want to share to you about. Um, you see here again, usually when we have international events uh, in, uh, with, with Akbayan and our sister parties, the Asian delegation would always be very small because it's really expensive to go from here to Europe when you have the international events there. Um, but Howard Lee, one of our comrades from Malaysia, would be elected president of the International Union of Socialist Youth. So we, we were very proud because even with a small delegation, we were able to get someone elected. Howard Lee in 2016 would also be leading, a leading voice uh, calling for clean elections in Malaysia with the Bursi 5 uh, protests. Unfortunately, he too would feel the brunt of the state in Malaysia and would be arrested along with uh, several other opposition leaders. So they seem very happy though, no? <laughs> okay. Um, Future Forward Party from Thailand. This was already identified early on. I just want to, uh, to focus on them primarily because their party is very new and they're comprised by young people who know that together they can do more. And we're very, uh, they too are now being threatened of dissolution um, with the state saying that their party, political party should be closed down. So what am I saying? Just a final, some final notes. As you can see, young people in different countries face threat. And we too, the students here in the Philippines, face threat with legislators pushing for anti-subversion laws, uh, mandatory ROTC, and several other military, uh, efforts to militarize our schools. Um, so we too may be seeing similar instances. Maybe some call to action at this point. First and foremost, knowing that we're not alone, uh, also calls for us to have really more spaces for international solidarity. Because what we're experiencing in the Philippines is not an isolated case, as what we've seen. It is something that should push us further for broader international solidarity. But more importantly, that solidarity should push forward a certain vision. May it be for more uh, uh, freedom, for more equality, more social justice. We have to be clear with the uh, future that we want, especially for the young generation. We have to bring together um, legislators from different uh, countries who may be minority in their countries, but together we can have a greater voice. And finally, we know that uh, fighting against lawfare should be a resistance of young people. So we call on young, the, the, the fight for democracy should necessarily be youthful. Because if not, I, I believe if the young people are not part of the, uh, of the resistance to lawfare, um, we, it will be hard for us to define and recreate and hopefully not make the same mistakes of those who came before us. So with that, uh, for a uh, very youthful, but of course with uh, our friends from all sectors as well, uh, we resist. So maraming salamat, padayon po sa ating lahat. Maraming salamat, and for this panel, we have heard China, Singapore, Saudi Arabia, Brazil, France continue to feel, experience the weaponization of law. 
But in these areas, as well as uh, in other areas, the resistance grows. And the resistance from the youth is very strong, and we are inspired by that. We say that rule of law must lend itself to freedom, human rights, and social justice. We say that legal acrobatics cannot be tolerated and that we should continue to resist. 34 years ago, we won back our democracy here in the Philippines. Today, democracy here and in other parts of the world is in danger. And as the young people that was shown by Paeng had said, we will continue to resist and defend and win because we will all be together in solidarity. Maraming salamat. Thank you to our panelists. Children back in the streets at night Knocking on cars till the morning light People standing in line for a kilo of rice Welcome to the dark ages The era of life Another round of applause for our diverse and very youthful panel, moderated by an equally youthful personality, Secretary Dinky Suleiman. Maraming salamat po. At this point, we will hear a message of solidarity from the President of La France and Somes, proponent of increased labor rights and expansion of French welfare program, Mr. Jean-Luc Mélenchon. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. J'adresse un salut très amical au Forum international sur le law offert. Normalement, j'aurais dû me trouver parmi vous et partager vos travaux. Mais ce sont les circonstances de la vie politique de mon pays, la France, qui me retiennent ici parmi mes compatriotes. En effet, une très grande bataille politique est engagée pour la protection des régimes de retraite. Et vous autres qui êtes comme nous des gens simples, vous savez quelle importance peut avoir ce genre de questions dans la vie des gens ordinaires. Cependant, ma pensée est tournée vers vous. Avec euh, la persécution dont font l'objet plusieurs personnes aux Philippines, aux divers niveaux de la vie démocratique, syndicalistes, juges, militants politiques, nous voyons aux Philippines, un cas particulier et systématique de recours à ce que l'on appelle le la offert, c'est-à-dire la guerre du droit contre le droit des gens. La loi, normalement, doit protéger en toutes circonstances et dans tous les cas, avant toute chose, la liberté. La liberté de parler, la liberté d'écrire, la liberté de diffuser des idées, la liberté de contester les pouvoirs dès lors qu'on le fait dans des formes qui sont conformes à ce que la loi prévoit pour la paix publique. Alors, il y a déjà bien longtemps que nous sommes alertés sur le cas de la sénatrice Léla de Lima. À présent, nous voulons lui montrer notre complète solidarité, car dans de nombreux pays, nous avons pris conscience qu'il y avait dorénavant une nouvelle forme de lutte contre ceux qui sont les défenseurs de la liberté, quelles que soient leurs opinions politiques. Nous avons vu comment le président Lula, au Brésil, a été mis en cause, arrêté, et puis pour finir, relâché après que la preuve ait été faite que le jugement dont il avait fait l'objet était un jugement manipulé, truqué, avec de faux témoignages et des accusations sans fondement. Dans de nombreux autres pays, des personnalités de premier plan ont été traitées de cette façon. Moi-même, j'ai été jugé et condamné pour rébellion, et je ne veux pas vous cacher que je suis assez fier d'être le premier rebelle officiel de mon pays. Mais dans la circonstance qui est celle de l'ELA de Lima, il n'y a aucun motif à sourire. Tant de mois, tant de saisons en prison, pour l'unique raison, 
qu'elle a voulu défendre à sa façon, avec ses idées, la liberté des Philippins et le droit pour les Philippins de penser ce qu'ils veulent, comme ils veulent, et de s'opposer, s'ils le souhaitent, à la personne qui préside leur pays. Ces droits sont mis en cause un peu partout dans le monde. Et il est temps que s'opère un mouvement de rébellion, de mise en cause, qui démasque l'artifice que sont les soi-disant raisons légales d'emprisonner, de mettre des amendes, et ainsi de suite, pour tenter d'écraser ceux qui se battent et qui défendent les droits du commun des personnes. Mes chers amis, votre réunion est une première. En effet, c'est en Asie que l'on va voir pour la première fois se rassembler un large panel de représentants de différents pays. Croyez bien que je n'en suis que plus amer de ne pouvoir me trouver parmi vous. Néanmoins, ce que vous faites ouvre un chemin et je sais que bientôt nous aurons un forum de même nature et nous y travaillerons en Afrique, en Europe, dans les Amériques. Si bien que vous êtes les précurseurs, vous êtes ceux qui ouvraient le chemin, vous êtes ceux qui montraient une direction, vous êtes ceux qui donnaient une leçon de courage et de solidarité dans l'épreuve. Pour tout cela, merci à vous toutes et à vous tous. Bon. Merci, Monsieur Mélenchon. At this point, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to weave our tapestry of resistance as you proceed to your chosen breakout groups. If you still haven't made up your mind, kindly open your programs. The topics, schedules, and resource persons and pertinent information are inside. Again, please be back at the conference room by 3.40 in the afternoon. Again, 3.40 and we will begin with Plenary 4 at 3.40 in the afternoon. Maraming salamat po. Children begging in the streets at night. Knocking on cars.